Don't let him eat that burly bag, bro. Oh, that that's thing awesome. is so <laughs> big, Milan. Oh, look at you, bro. Look at the size of him. The lateral line is proudly partnered with Vertex Lubricants. This video is a how to make what we believe to be the very best trace for targeting sharks. Now, when I say the best trace, I mean the best trace for the shark. If you just want to see how to make the trace, go to the time on the screen right now. But before that, I would like to give you a backstory into why we're using the trace that we use. The very first time I ever went shark fishing with Milan, I used the rig that he used which was a big stainless steel circle hook on a doubled up 400 pound mono trace. The first bronze weight of shark that I ever caught using that rig was gut hooked. And when we got the shark to the beach, I had to cut the line off, leaving the hook inside the shark's stomach. That experience made me feel literally sick and I had no want to ever go shark fishing again. Milan said to me that gut hooking a fish with a circle hook was extremely rare and he encouraged me to have another go on another day. The next bronze whaler shark I caught was hooked in the corner of the mouth like it was supposed to be, but I couldn't remove the hook and again I had to cut the line and again I felt incredibly sick leaving a hook in a fish for so-called sport. So the next time round, I filed the barb completely off the circle hook. But even with the barb completely filed off the circle hook and the shark on the beach, I was still unable to remove the hook from the corner of the shark's mouth. After leaving a hook in a shark for the third time, I vowed I was never going to deliberately target a shark ever again. Full stop, not interested, no fun was being had. Sometime later, I watched a land-based game fishing DVD made by a guy called Paul Embling. In that DVD, Paul was shark fishing land-based and he described a shark rig that hooked the fish in the mouth every time and every shark that he landed on the beach, he was able to remove the hook from easily. He stated that not once was Paul unable to remove the hook from a shark that he managed to get to the beach. So I copied Paul's rig and I set off shark fishing once again and that rig of Paul's worked flawlessly perfect. I have since caught myself and helped other people catch heaps of bronze whaler sharks and we have also accidentally caught a few great white sharks and I can say smiling with my hand over my heart every single shark that I have ever landed or helped somebody land using the rig described by Paul I was able to remove the hook easily from every single shark without exception but I will freely admit to having to, on a few occasions, use a stick to remove the hook from a shark's mouth for obvious reasons. I like my hands the way they are and I would like them to stay attached to my arms. Now that you know why we use the rig that we use, it is time to show you how to make it. I'm going to remember this day for a very long time, my man. Come on, little dude. Come on, we want you to be a three or four metre jobby. Yeah, I'll walk out with him if you want. No, you're right, I'll film it. You walk out with him, bro. Here you go. Woo! Oh, Thank oh, you, Mum. Oh, 
Oh. Alrighty, so the gear you're going to need six to eight hundred pounds steel trace. A, we're using a 10 baro mustard J hook with the barb filed completely off it. So there's absolutely no resistance when you're trying to pull the, the hook out of the shark. Steel crimps. There are crimps specific for steel. They look something like that. And then you're going to need a pair of crimping pliers that are, again, specific to those steel crimps. I like using solid rings. I used to use swivels, but I had a swivel fail. So now I use a solid ring. You can just use one basic solid ring. But um, I kind of like these ones. It's got the like little line protective thingy on it. And that second ring there is where I tie the rock to, which I will explain the rock later in the video. And then line protectors for the other end. That's it. Let's make it. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is put the trace onto the hook. Now the trace, you want to put it down through the eye of the hook that way. Around the shank of the hook. And then back up the same way you went in. Like so. And then you want to pull that up tight. And what that does is give a rigid connection between the steel trace and the hook. We just want that rigid connection. That rigid connection between the hook and the steel trace aids in a mouth hookup. And better yet, it helps push that hook into the corner of the mouth. We find that the bigger fish are usually hooked in the corner of the mouth. The small fish can be hooked anywhere, but they're always hooked in the mouth with this system. Alrighty, so now we're going to put a couple of crimps on. I double crimp everything because <laughs> I learnt the hard way that sometimes one crimp isn't enough. And again, I like that real rigid connection between the hook and the trace. So if you double crimp it, then you can you keep the tag end at full length. Oop, twisting it the wrong way. All right, so I put one crimp right down by the hook and then a second crimp up at the end of the trace and the second crimp, I also like to only have the steel go halfway through the crimp so there isn't wire hanging out the other end of the crimp like that and then when you crimp it you get all these little sharp pieces so I just have that one crimped just over the end like that so that the end of the trace is hidden inside the crimp. That one there is giving all the strength and that one there is just tidying things up, making sure the other one doesn't fail. Now from the hook down to the solid ring where we tie the rock on, there will be a rock tied onto the rig here and with that piece of steel only being 600 mil long, it doesn't leave enough slack line for the shark to be able to completely swallow the hook and that way it gets hooked in the mouth. So the rock that's tied here actually sets the hook. So yeah, solid ring here at about 600 mil long. I should have mentioned in the gear list that you're gonna need a pair of steel wire cutters as well. And before you start cutting your steel, do these up real tight so that the, there's no slack in between the two blades, otherwise you end up getting lots of frilly bits on your steel. So if they're done up nice and tight, it should cut nice and clean like that. Alrighty. Double crimped again. Double crimp everything. Solid ring. Alrighty, and then again I use these um, these types of solid rings with that little piece on there to put the steel into. Again, I'm just trying to avoid folding the steel completely in half. The line protector just gives it a little bit of a better angle, I guess.
and the same deal just the second piece of wire only have it halfway through halfway through the crimp otherwise you end up with little pieces of wire stabbing you in the hand when you're dealing with the trace which is not much fun at all I've just gone ahead and finished the rig because once you've seen me crimp a crimp once, you've seen me do it a hundred times, right? So, finished rig, open gape, 10 baro mustard J hook with the barb fold completely off it. Then we've made that rigid connection with six to 800 pound steel trace going through the eye of the hook, around the shank and back out. Double crimped, and I like to keep that tag end a little bit longer so that you got that rigid connection that rigid connection aids in the mouth hookup 600 mil from the back of the hook to a solid ring now that solid ring is a crucial part of this rig because that is where we tie the rock onto and i'll explain the rock in a second when i first started copying this rig off paul paul was running a big mono heavy trace from here on for the rest of it but I've had fish bite me off within the first couple of meters of that mono and I think that's due to the fish drum rolling in the trace, barrel rolling in it, the line getting wrapped around the fish and then the mono trace going back through the fish's mouth and then biting me off. So now I run a full five to seven meters of six to 800 pound steel trace. So yeah, again, double crimped line protector onto that solid ring. Another five or so meters Again, to a double crimped solid ring. And onto this solid ring, I'll then crimp as much sort of 400 pound, 500 pound mono as I possibly can. Again, if that fish drum rolls in your trace and wraps that trace around it to the point where the braid touches the fish of the shark, the skin of a shark is like sandpaper and it'll just bust you off instantly the second the braid touches the fish. So as much protection as possible is a good thing. I have just literally tied the shark trace onto a rod and reel, stuck the rod and reel in the rod holder of the boat and we're going to imagine that the floor of the shed is the floor of the ocean and I'm doing this just to best describe how to fish this rig and what's going on down there. So we have lowered our rock down to the bottom. We tie our rock on with a heavy braid um, to that solid ring. You will be shocked and amazed at how quickly and how easily the rock cuts the braid when the shark bites the bait and then the rock is broken free, the braid stays tied to the trace and then you can just cut that off when it gets back to the boat. Now the bait. Try not to get hung up on this whole big boy, big fish theory. It's not entirely true when it comes to shark fishing. In my twisted little head, if a shark can fit something in its mouth, then it's going to swallow it. So if your bait that you have set is too big and the fish can't fit the bait in its mouth, then it's going to do what sharks do and it's going to bite it, shake its head around, and break it down into bits that it can swallow. So again, if your bait is too big that the shark can't fit it in its mouth, it's gonna bite down on the bait. If it bites down on the bait at the other end of the bait to where the hook is, or it bites the bait where the hook isn't, you're not gonna hook the fish. It's then gonna shake its head around and pull your bait off the hook, or worse, it's going to break the rock free. Now, when the rock is broken free off this rig, you need to wind up immediately and put a new rock on. Otherwise, there is nothing stopping the fish from swallowing the bait and getting gill or gut hooked. We just go for a walk on the beach before we go shark fishing and pick up a heap of rocks. Therefore, it is in a drama. And some days you'll have a harbour or where you're fishing will just be plagued with little fish and little fish will be biting the bait, shaking the head around, breaking the rocks off, and you'll have to reset the bait over and over and over. So with all that being said, in my mind, you wanna have a bait about the size of that rock, a big handful size, sort of that half a skipjack tuna. Um, when we're doing this, we're targeting bronze whaler sharks, and a bronzy can easily fit a half a skipjack tuna or that big 
handful size bait in its mouth, no problem. I also go to the extra trouble of tying my hooks onto the bait. Obviously there's no barb on the hook to keep it in the bait. And with all fishing, you want your hooks as exposed as possible. And I believe that's best done tying the hook to the bait. And when I tie the bait on, I try and tie it to the shank of the hook as opposed to tying it right onto the bend of the hook. If when you hook the fish, the bait doesn't break away immediately, you've now got a bait hanging off the end of the hook and that might just end up pulling the bait out of the fish's mouth. So by tying it there, I'm just hoping that if the bait doesn't break away immediately, then the bait's kind of trailing behind the hook, the same as the trace and everything else, and it will actually help keep the hook in rather than pull it out, if that makes sense at all. So the shark comes in, picks up our beautiful bite-sized bait because he can fit the bait in his mouth, the hook's now in his mouth. Because we've got that rock tied 600 mils away from the hook, the hook is instantly set in the fish's mouth. When the fish gets pricked with that sharp hook, fish bolts. That in turn then breaks the rock free off the rig and we've got a tight line set from the rock all the way up to the rod tip. And then we have the lightest drag that we could possibly have to keep that barbless hook in the fish's mouth. If you have too much drag on the reel, then it's really hard to get the rod and reel up out of the rod holder because the butt of the rod's kind of bent inside the rod holder. So once line is evaporating off the reel, pull the rod and reel up out of the rod holder, do your drag up and fight your fish. We never shark fish where we can't get the shark to the beach because I believe that taking the hook out of the shark is the best and the safest for not only you but for the fish as well if you do it on the beach. So at the end of this video I will add a little clip of how best to deal with the shark on the beach and what to do and all the rest of it. And then that will be the end of this video. You are watching this video because myself and Milan, like the rest of New Zealand, are right now in lockdown and we haven't been able to get out and create content because apparently now we are content creators, um, which is awesome, right? But yes, the next time I see you, hopefully lockdown is over and me and Milan will be back out doing our best to have as much fun as we can and catch something to eat. Just want to say a huge thank you to all the people doing all the YouTube stuff, especially the commenting. At the moment, I am stuck at home again like the rest of New Zealand and sitting there and returning comments and replying to comments is better than going stir crazy. So uh, yeah, appreciate all the comments. A little bit of video to follow and that'll be it. Hopefully the next time I see you, it will be on a fishing mission. Thanks for watching. Whenever you're doing this, I think the best thing to do, hand on the fish, don't try and kind of reach around it. Hand on the fish, that way when you're going down, if the fish rears up, you come up with it. Just over the front of its nose, just lifting up, and that's perfectly what we've designed that rig for. That, again, it's Paul Embling's rig that I copied. And then from there, because there's no barb on the hook, it literally just falls out. You don't have to have his head out of the water. You want to keep the gills in the water. Like I say, as soon as the belly hits the bottom, bronzies and all the sharks that we've caught just completely immobilize and just sit there for you. Let you get your hook out. We're often taking heaps of other people's hooks out of their faces. They come in with jigs and lures and you wouldn't believe the amount of jewelry that they can pick up. Leading them goes the real easy part and in my opinion, the best part. So just stay down the tail end. They do like to sort of say hello before they go sometimes. And then just because you haven't taken them out of the water too much, he should just slide off. And then as soon as he's floating, then generally they'll start to kick. And just hold on to their tail because they often kind of get a little bit disorientated and start coming back into the beach. So you just got to guide them a little bit. Come on, mate. And then once he's pointed in the right direction, leave him rip. Come on, Papa. <laughs> and that's shark fishing, NATO and Milan stalls.
The lateral line is proudly partnered with Vertex Lubricants.